Now using a retraction system fixed to the operating table for our exposure, all four quadrants of the abdomen plus the pelvis can be visually inspected. Obvious from this wide exposure necessary for cytoreductive surgery are the two major components of the peritoneal cavity. The two major divisions are the supramesocolic and inframesocolic compartments separated by the transverse colon. The abdominal exploration starts in the right upper quadrant and will proceed in a clockwise direction around the abdomen and pelvis. The distribution and extent of cancer nodules will be recorded on a diagram of the peritoneal cancer index. The peritoneal cancer index, abbreviated PCI, allows an estimate of the distribution and extent of disease. Our goal now is to visualize all the peritoneal surfaces that may contain nodules, referred to as peritoneal metastases. The first peritoneal space to be explored is the right subphrenic space. The superior limit is the undersurface of the right hemidiaphragm, and the inferior boundary is Glisson's capsule of the liver. The exploration is manual with the gloved hand, but also visual back to the right coronary ligament, which is the attachment of the liver to the diaphragm. The coronary ligament is immediately superior to the bare area of the liver. Laterally, the right coronary ligament is terminated as the right triangular ligament. Moving from right to left on the liver is the falciform ligament and round ligament, remnants of the ventral mesentery, which is largely resorbed. The falciform ligament separates liver segments 4 from 2 and 3 and plays a prominent role in diverting peritoneal fluid from the right subphrenic space towards the mid-abdomen. At the leading edge of the falciform ligament is the round ligament. We follow the round ligament to the hepatic bridge, also called the pont hepatique. This inconsistent yet extremely important anatomic structure creates a peritoneal tunnel that surrounds the round ligament. If a hepatic bridge has formed across the round ligament, cancer cells may be present but not visible or palpable within this peritoneal tunnel. If there is a high index of suspicion for peritoneal metastases at this site, the hepatic bridge must be surgically divided to expose the site at which the round ligament enters the liver. Moving to the left beyond the falciform ligament is the left anterior perihepatic space, or sometimes called the left subphrenic space. The superior surface is the undersurface of the left hemidiaphragm, and the inferior border is the left lateral segment of the liver. Retraction of this portion of the liver exposes the left coronary ligament and left triangular ligament. The left triangular ligament is continuous medially with the left layer of the falciform ligament and posteriorly continuous with the lesser omentum. The left posterior perihepatic space, also known as the gastrohepatic recess, lies inferior to the left lateral segment of the liver and extends into the fissure of the ligamentum venosum. Its posterior border is the lesser omentum. Continuing to move clockwise around the abdomen, the spleen becomes prominent. 
medially and anterior to the spleen, we see the gastrosplenic ligament that runs between the greater curvature of the stomach and the hilum of the spleen. It contains within the short gastric and left gastroepiploic branches of the splenic artery. Posteriorly is the well-developed splenorenal ligament passing from spleen to posterior abdominal wall in the region of the left kidney. Continuing to move in a clockwise direction, the left paracolic sulcus is a large free peritoneal space attached medially to the descending colon. Inferiorly, the junction of sigmoid and descending colon is more broadly attached by natural adhesions to the left lateral abdominal sidewall. This defines an unnamed recess important in the assessment of peritoneal metastases. Tumor implants progressing at this site may invade the vascular structures of the sigmoid colon and therefore may require a sigmoid colon resection as part of a complete cytoreduction. Just beyond the internal barrier created by the lateral attachment of the junction of sigmoid and descending colon, we encounter the pelvis. This space is lined by the peritoneum of the left pelvic sidewall, which continues down to the left pararectal fossa. The peritoneal covering of the bladder, seminal vesicles, and the anterior aspect of the rectum merge, producing the rectovesical pouch. Anteriorly, the rectovesical pouch is limited laterally by the right and left sacrogenital folds, which extend from the sides of the bladder posteriorly to the anterior aspect of the sacrum. Laterally, the ureters and iliac vessels may cause slight elevations of the peritoneum. Of course, in a woman, the anatomy is more complex because the uterus divides the pelvic peritoneal space into an anterior and posterior compartment. The peritoneal surface of the bladder with anterior surface of the uterus defines the vesico-uterine space. The posterior aspect of the cervix and uterus with the anterior aspect of the rectum defines the recto-uterine space. This space is extremely variable in its extent. The anterior aspect of the recto-uterine space can, in some women, continue along a large extent of the posterior vagina and anterior rectum, making a deep and long cul-de-sac. This is the recto-uterine pouch of Douglas. Peritoneum is reflected from the anterior and posterior uterine surfaces to the lateral pelvic sidewalls as the broad ligaments of the uterus. At the superior margin of the broad ligaments are the fallopian tubes. The ovaries are attached to the posterior aspect of the broad ligaments and lie in a shallow depression, the ovarian fossa. Before moving from the pelvis up the right paracolic sulcus, we should attempt to visualize the peritoneum of the lower anterior abdominal wall. This is difficult through a midline abdominal incision. There are five ridges descending from the umbilicus towards the pelvis. The median umbilical fold is defined by the uracus. The medial umbilical fold is defined by the obliterated umbilical artery and the lateral umbilical fold covers the inferior epigastric artery. A peritoneal metastasis is identified on the right pelvic sidewall. Continuing clockwise, the right paracolic sulcus is a large free peritoneal space defined by the omentum covering the ascending colon medially and the perirenal fat of the right kidney inferiorly. It leads into the hepatorenal pouch. 
in this patient, the inferior aspect of the right paracolic space is occupied in part by a peritoneal metastasis from an appendiceal cancer. To visualize the hepatorenal pouch, or Morrison's pouch, the right lobe of the liver is manually retracted anteriorly from right to left. This surgically important space is defined medially by the inferior vena cava, superiorly by the posterior aspect of the right lobe of the liver, and laterally by the abdominal wall. The posterior surface is the peritoneal covering of the right kidney, adrenal gland, and muscular attachments of the diaphragm to the ribs. After the clockwise exploration of the parietal peritoneum, the visceral peritoneum must be visualized. However, before we explore the small bowel, the greater omentum must be lifted away from the anterior surfaces of the small bowel. The anterior layer of peritoneum is continuous with the visceral peritoneum of the anterior surface of the stomach. The posterior sheet is attached to the posterior abdominal wall above the origin of the small intestine. The exploration of the small bowel begins at the duodenal jejunal junction at the base of the mesentery of the transverse colon. After locating the most proximal portion of the jejunum, this structure is placed on superior traction to expose the duodeno-mesocolic fold that defines the inferior duodenal recess. This is an important peritoneal space to clearly visualize when exploring the abdomen for peritoneal metastases. Other less consistent recesses around the duodenal jejunal junction may be present. Here, a superior duodenal recess is obvious. Also, there is a retroduodenal recess that can be digitally and visibly explored. The small bowel is manually and visibly explored from upper to lower jejunum and from upper to lower ilium, taking care to note any abnormalities on both sides of the small bowel mesentery. For the most part, the jejunum lies on the left side of the abdomen and the ilium lies on the right side of the abdomen. The crossing loop of small bowel runs from the left lower to the right upper part of the abdomen. The peritoneum on the visceral structures is densely adherent to the small bowel surface and the small bowel mesentery. Also, its composition is thinner and less strong than the parietal peritoneum. It cannot be stripped from the visceral structures beneath as a peritoneectomy procedure of the parietal peritoneum. Small invasive nodules and larger non-invasive nodules can be resected from the visceral peritoneum, but damage to the bowel surface must be avoided, or if this occurs, must be carefully repaired. As the exploration reaches the ileocecal valve region, several recesses can be identified. Below the terminal ilium and defined by the anterior cecal artery is the inferior ileocecal recess. Above the terminal ilium is the anterior ileocecal recess. After a complete abdominal and pelvic exploration, the lesser sac must be inspected and its surfaces visualized. The first maneuver is to explore the epiploic foramen or foramen of Winslow with the plastic suction tip. The posterior aspect of the hepatoduodenal ligament is inspected. In patients with peritoneal metastases, it is important to visualize an unnamed crevice or fissure created by the shelf of liver, which is the junction of the right and left caudate lobes of the liver. 
the lesser omentum is a part of the ventral mesentery that does not resorb. It runs from the inferior surface of the liver to the abdominal esophagus, lesser curvature of the stomach, and first part of the duodenum. The lesser omentum is the anterior wall of the lesser sac. It is composed of two parts. The larger portion to the left is the gastrohepatic ligament, and to the right is the anterior aspect of the hepatoduodenal ligament. The extreme right edge of the hepatoduodenal ligament forms the anterior portion of the foramen of Winslow. The foramen of Winslow is the only natural communication between the greater and lesser sac. To expose the peritoneum that surrounds the lesser sac, sometimes called the omental bursa, the left lateral segment of the liver is reflected superiorly from left to right. The gastropatic ligament has been divided from its attachments to the liver, taking care to avoid an accessory left hepatic artery. The hepatic branches of the vagus nerve need to be divided. With this exposure, the peritoneum of the omental bursa can be visualized. The bursa can be divided into a smaller superior recess, which encloses the caudate lobe of the liver, and an inferior recess, which lies between stomach and pancreas. Because the parietal peritoneum of the superior recess of the lesser sac is strong, and loosely attached to the underlying structures, peritoneectomy can be performed. Part of the inferior recess of the lesser sac is the subpyloric space. Tumor cells that enter the lesser sac through the foramen of Winslow will accumulate by gravity in this most dependent portion of the lesser sac. It is defined on the right by the first portion of the duodenum, anteriorly by the antrum of the stomach, and posteriorly by the head of the pancreas. Peritoneectomy within the inferior recess, especially over the pancreas, is difficult and likely to damage the anterior surface of the pancreas. In summary, exploration of the parietal peritoneum began at the peritoneal surface of the anterior abdominal wall. Then from the right subphrenic space, it moved in a clockwise direction to the undersurface of the left hemidiaphragm and then down the paracolic sulcus to the pelvis. From the pelvis, the exploration moved up the right paracolic sulcus to the right hepatorenal pouch. After exploration of the visceral peritoneum, the gastrohepatic ligament was divided to explore the peritoneal surfaces of the lesser sac. At the conclusion of the peritoneal exploration, we must determine the peritoneal cancer index. In this patient, it was 5.